a question for over the month. We've uh, just sent out our call for editorial partnerships for 2014 on SMC. And this is looking both for academic and think tank partners and any other kind of partner who might be interested either in short-term partnerships, which are often framed around an event that they're doing, or um, uh, long-term partnerships, which involve building a new vocabulary and building it, in our case, for maybe a global audience at the same time as you're trying to win a new audience for your area of expertise. Uh, another thing we do with the more the shorter term partnerships is that we often launch what we call a guest week on the front of the Open Democracy, where you can take over the front page for a week and publish seven to ten articles. And what that does, if it's well done with a guided walk, which explains to the readers what each article is doing under your heading, is sort of introduce a new theme into the bloodstream so it's a good prelude to doing further cooperation. Um, it's not often when we launch such a call for editorial partnerships that we have a chance to then follow it up by addressing some of you prospective partners directly and hoping to uh, win you over a uh, slightly like more in-depth discussion about what British democracy is trying to do. And so I'm hoping to take advantage of that. And also, just a little bit, to begin to answer the question that I was given, um, how can politics, <coughs> academics, blog effectively? What do we think um, effective blogging is? And I will be giving you a sort of open democracy answer on that. It seems to me that to answer that question, you have to answer a series of further questions, which have been mentioned in the discussions today. Um, who is the content for is a very big question. <laughs> that needs sorting out before you start. Um, another question I would put to somebody who is interested in working with us is what conversation is this already part of? And I suppose my third key question would be to myself, to us at Open Democracy, and to our partners at the same time, how can the wider audience be built for that particular conversation the most effective? It's in that order. And you'll notice that I keep going on about conversations, and that indeed is going to be one of the themes of what I'm saying. I think effective blogging is always to do with um, whether you have tapped in successfully to a conversation. So I think the talk about voice, uh, I think the fact that Will has happily fallen on the name conversation or not Will, but your outfit, um, I think that that puts us in a place that's worth lingering in and sort of <coughs> thinking about because it is very different from any other kind of function to, to enter into that conversation. You're probably least likely to come to open democracy if you will answer those three questions with, I want people in my field to be aware of my research and what I want the cutting edge debate on the developments in my field. However, at open democracy, I have to say, we would come straight back to you and say, well, actually, there's nothing much better for a general readership than being given permission to press their noses up against a glass pane. And over here, a passionate discussion between experts in their field, unguardedly exchanging views about what they think matters to them. And uh, in that connection, I often think of uh, Cathy and Heathcliff with their noses up against the window <coughs> of Thrush Cross Grange. And you can immediately begin to see that there's a political democratic challenge involved in opening yourself up in that fashion. So I wouldn't want to actually turn my back on any academic who was actually interested in their academic work at the starting point. I think that would be a real shame. However, um, at Open Democracy, it's true to say that we do have a particular concern with open, open democracies. And so um, I found very useful Stuart's um, uh, remarks in, in inspired. Um, and in particular, I suppose we connect with this point about moving towards the democratic model of impact. And that is a search for wider audiences um, for important, uh, important knowledges and uh, also a, a desire to transfer knowledge out from the powerful to the less powerful and also just a desire to transfer knowledge uh, because we actually believe passionately in open and pluralist debate as a way of building 
better democracies. So, um, I mean, of course, these are all huge, huge terms. But when we say a open democracy, we're interested in wider audiences. This is not clear. I mean, we are very interested in transnational <laughs> conversations. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, but uh, even global conversations. So we are extremely ambitious. Um, the point is, obviously, you can be committed to democracy and open democracies in all sorts of different ways. Um, for example, as editor, um, I'm editor of the main site of Open Democracy, or a rather flat structure, so we have a lot of specialist sections alongside me. For example, Our Kingdom, which is um, partnering a research <coughs> on democratic wealth today, as you'll, you'll hear more about, is an independent section with its own editorial team. So I'm editor of the main site. That includes one or two particular <coughs> debates around Can Europe Make It and Arab Awakening. And I'm also responsible for submissions. Submissions come in from all over the world, and we try and publish about a third of them. Um, so that's that's where I come in. And partly maybe because I, I edit in Europe Make It, I'm obsessed at the moment at the moment with the democratic deficit in Europe as we head towards the European election. <coughs> And the despair with which any any ambitious editor is trying to create an interesting discussion on the subject. Um, I'm worried about that. I'm also worried about the dominance of unelected bodies over our lives in Europe and the fact that politicians are often incapable of approaching policy in a complex enough way. There's too much spin. And that between these technocratic aspects of government creeping into Europe and and these uh, politicians who are not fulfilling their responsibilities, we have this uh, awful uh, lowering, I think, of our democratic uh, culture. We have the rise of populism and the threat of particular kinds of populism, which I think are extremely dangerous. And so, you know, these are my concerns about democracy. And I'm trying to think about what could one do in order to build audiences that could begin to fight back against that gap, really the gap that we have now increasingly um, with our political representatives, for example. So, you know, those might be my democratic questions, but there are heaps of others. I mean, if I was involved in the fantastic um, research on immigration, which I know that's in Oxford, or, or climate change, um, I would be very, very interested, I think, in building new informed publics. Um, and new informed publics that would push back not just against <coughs> unaccountable power or against low levels of influence um, uh, by the public on decision makers, but also push back against the media, because the media, of course, are already very engaged in quite determined conversations on these subjects and many others, and sometimes with really deleterious results. So I think any of us who are interested in democracy today have a lot of reasons for wanting to think about building audience. What we want, it seems to me, in societies like ours is more sophisticated and more diverse puppets. People who actively want at least some kind of say. That is, engaged communities of interest. And that is going to be one of the phrases, I think, that I want to leave you with in my, in my ten minutes. Right, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very ambitious. I mean, I want transnational conversations. I want engaged conversations. I want to build alternative, diverse publics who really want to get involved in terribly complex and difficult issues. Um, frankly, it sounds like a complete disaster. And uh, the only thing I can say to you is that I think there are some good news to be said. And those good news, that good news, comes from the nature of the net itself. And I think that that's something that is democracy has spent its 11 years of um, 11 upwards learning about. And for me, this tips the scales towards a sort of open democracy project. And what I mean by that is that I think that built into the net, there really is a sort of democratic advantage of what we call the digital commons. We have very recently started <coughs> describing open democracy itself as a digital commons. But I do think that it is this respect for um, uh, essentially the digital commons nature of, uh, of the net, which allows really effective political blogging. I realize that's a slightly contentious 
statement which I'm going to try and sort of fill it out a little bit. Uh, what does digital commons mean to open democracy and why has it taken us more than a decade to begin to refer to commons <coughs> in this fashion? Most obviously, our 20,000 upwards uh, articles in our archive, most of them were given to us free by authors who wish to share their work with our readers. And uh, I think that it's taken us rather an inordinately long time to ask ourselves why they bothered. I mean, every now and again one would stop and say to oneself, gosh, I say, you know, what a fantastic piece that is. But on the whole, I don't think as a group we really got together and said, what's going on here? I mean, the hours that we put in to writing absolutely quality stuff. <coughs> so terribly busy people, terribly busy people, involved people, committed people. Um, you know, why? <coughs> and one of the things that, of course, they did want to do was to share. And I think we've really underestimated that, and I think it's well worth simply lingering on that. Another thing that happened to us, which um, I think we didn't know the full implications at the time, or at least most of us didn't, I think Tony Curzon Price, who was then our editor-in-chief, did, was that we, we adopted a Creative Commons license, which you've also heard about from the conversation, which means that you lock pieces open. And you lock pieces open for distribution. And I, when I say that I think we underestimated the impact of that, I'm saying that I don't think we noticed at the time that this is a choice, really, about where one places the value in intellectual property. And if you place it in distribution and not in exclusive ownership, then a hell of a lot follows from that. If, you know, what follows from that is the way you do things, the interest you take in who's interested in you, and actually you have a completely different relationship, it seems to me, to your readers. Um, I think that, in a way, we are all of us who are engaged in enjoying blocking, locked in a sort of rearguard action with uh, intellectual property rights of the exclusive property type. And I do think that for every group of people who want to blog, there are things to be thought about around this, around whether you are most interested in exclusive ownership, or whether you're interested in building a public domain, and the implications of that, whether you're interested in defending fair use, whether that's in the public in political debate, or in artistic expression, or in media, or in a whole load of other areas which traditionally were part of fair use, but which have really been encroached upon um, by the intellectual property rights and their inexorable rise and rise um, during the internet era. Um, I think the commodification of knowledge and the turning of knowledge into units is something that academics as well, maybe not the, the most elite universities, but a lot of the time actually have to deal with. And I do think that what we want to do is completely different from the mod modification of the knowledge. What we want to do is to build a sharing conversation, um, one that involves people and one that actually actively involves them. So um, it is a move from a sort of one-way hub and spoke system to this end-to-end -end architecture that's also involved. And I think that that's also terribly important for us to remember, because it means that instead of us being a sort of gatekeeper in authority, what we really have to do is to, as best we can, offer a platform for the active users to come and find what they want on our site. And looking at it that way around is, um, I think, extremely important. Um, so, I couldn't sort of agree more with the, the, my, my fellow panelists who said that you, know, you have to want to communicate <coughs> in the first place. There's absolutely no point in, uh, in, in going it on the net unless what you're interested in is putting yourself at the mercy of as many people as possible. And it, and it is like that you know, on many days for many, for many people. So, um, why has it taken us such years to work out that, that the sharing is really important and that this involves a turnaround in the status and power, really, of these active users in our world doing their own thing? I think one reason is because we've been somewhat distracted by this whole emphasis on likes 
And this is what I really mean by commodification. I mean, it makes no sense, actually, in a fundamental way, if you have a, a comment space, to click best, which actually wrecks that conversation, um, because it puts your favorite comment at the top, and everything else goes out of filter. And in exactly the same way, Facebook pages tend to aggregate your top article, and people have a vested interest in then promoting one article <coughs> a day, whereas in fact what you want to do is to promote several articles. Not only that, you actually want to promote a debate, and I'd like to stress the importance of debate. Um, very often, again, I think academics tend to be somewhat dissuaded from energetic debate with their fellows. That's a hell of a shame because it's a bit like having your nose up against the window. If you can hear a debate, then you, the reader, are in a position where you have to make up your mind what you think. You're already more active than you would have been, and that's actually gold dust for anyone who, who wants to vote. And maybe the last point I'd better make, since I'm running out of time, is to also emphasize this question of voice. I think voice is terribly important, and that's because of the nature of what I think is this underlying revolution that's taking place. With the increasing empowerment of people in their own right, they don't do things unless they want to, and they don't expect you to do things unless you want to. And actually, effective blogging is all about catching that spark. You have to start off with the enthusiasts for a particular subject, even if that's only one person, and build your concentric circles around that. And that's really the way that you, you build a public for a particular, for a particular uh, set of issues. And that's what you're doing. You're building engaged communities, and they're very diverse communities. So it's no accident that open democracy absolutely prides itself on a pluralist position. We don't have an editorial line more than that. We go for different views that we can possibly get them, which is very hard when we don't have <coughs> commissioning budgets. Different views on the same thing, because we want to be able to put the author in that. Uh, sitting on the edge of their seat, making up their own minds. 